Good evening. My name is Don Ficken. I'm with the uh, Library Telescope Program. I'm glad to have you tonight. Uh, I've got my colleague Tom Lynch here and our presenter that uh, will be doing a, a short program, 30 minute program. Uh, this is a fun program tonight about fall constellations. But before we get started and we get uh, Rocky start sharing his screen, what I'd like to do is go through just a few things. If you're not familiar with the uh, Library Telescope Program, believe it or not, we've been around a long time since 2008. It was started in New Hampshire and we have both telescopes and binoculars and uh, we're up to over 900 locations now. Um, throughout the world. Um, in Canada, we've pretty much penetrated every place, US, most states, and then we've got, uh, I think, New Netherlands and New Zealand actually have telescopes for checkout, just like a book. Our goal is pretty simple. We want to, we're all volunteers, unpaid volunteers. We want to grow the program and share best practices. We get together each month uh, as a bunch of program managers and figure out uh, how to make things better. Um, Tom Lynch, he's our superstar here. He's been working on our Facebook page and he has well over 5,000 followers and he does lots of cool cartoons and astronomy related facts and just a wonderful bunch of things there that are things you just might really enjoy. And we've also got a very robust website. Uh, it's got a world map that lists what we think are the, all the participating libraries, but there probably are some we don't know about. If you have a library that has a library telescope program, it's not on our list, just go to our website and let us know. You could submit your request and we'll put the add you to our listing. And we also have a lot of resources, not for just uh, libraries that are operating the program, but for things like sky maps and things like that, that you can get from our page. This is uh, obviously a labor of love. We've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, and we certainly welcome any input that you might have. One of the things that are available on the front page of our website is uh, a series of sky maps, both in English and Spanish. Um, this is courtesy of the Astronomical League. John Goss is one of our members. He participates in our program pretty regularly, and uh, he does a wonderful job. Um, not only is it just about the August night sky in English and Spanish, just other cool stuff. So if you just check out the homepage of our Library Telescope Program uh, website, you'll be able to see this, and then you'll be able to find this, I think, pretty fun. So last month, we did a program, uh, which is kind of a, not necessarily a new idea. We did one on the library telescope programs in schools. Schools are getting more active in this. Uh, one of our members has been with us a bit now. Uh, he's launched it, and he thinks that's a really great way to engage children in science and the students in science. This month, of course, we have the fall constellations from binoculars and small telescopes. And next month, we have uh, a program of pocket planetarium. So if you really want to know how to access the sky. I mean, you'll find, frankly, that what I find working with library patr patrons, they figure out the telescope pretty quickly, but they don't know where to find anything. And so this will be part of what Rocky tonight talks about is just, hey, here's some stuff you can find, even if you got just as binoculars or small telescopes. But there's a lot of really great technology. And by the way, the children love the technology, so they just jump on that really fast. And you can get uh, our our programs as far as well, tonight. We'll record this, of course, being live streamed on Facebook, but we will also post this on our YouTube account. We have a whole library. I think we're well over 30 programs we've done over the last couple of years. Everything from how to launch a program, how to do binocular programs, uh, programs in schools and things like that, things about the eclipse, all that kind of stuff. Just go to our YouTube account. And uh, just you just go to librarytelescope.org and there's a YouTube link on there. Just go to that. And then, of course, all these programs have been recorded on Facebook through Facebook Live. You could find them there. Whoops, uh, I think I got the wrong guy from last month. But anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Rocky here. And so, Rocky, if you want to go ahead and sh share your screen, let's get going. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, what are binoculars fun? That's all I can tell you. It's just a lot of fun to have binoculars here. So. Okay, uh, screens up and everything, John? Yeah, you were looking at it just okay. fine, thank you. Okay, um, well, uh, I wanted the title, when I first started out, I said the title needs to be Clash of the Titans, and Don said, no, we need something a little more descriptive. So I said, okay, I'll just put it on my first slide. So so I've got, so, um, and the reason I call it Clash of the Titans is because almost all, well, all, all of the, uh, figures or, or uh, things that are in the uh, story are in the fall sky. And so we're going to learn how to find them tonight and learn how to find what's some, some things that are in them. But I'm going to start out with the with the with some of the legends and, and I'm sure they'll be repetitive to some of you. But um, uh, first of all, Perseus and Perseus was a Greek hero and he was uh, the son of Zeus and a mortal. 
Danae or Danae, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And um, uh, I think there, there was a prophecy that, that he would kill his father, his father, the king, or, or he would kill the king. And uh, so he was exiled from his homeland and he and his mother were set adrift in a boat, I think. And uh, they landed on a remote island where there was another king and, uh, that, uh, um, anyway, uh, he liked, uh, of course, Perseus's mother was very pretty. And so he was attracted to his, his mother and um, uh, Perseus didn't like him. So he tricked Perseus by inviting him to a party where everybody had big gifts. And Perseus said he would do whatever he wanted as his gift. So he told him he wanted Medusa's head. So uh, Perseus set off on his quest to get Medusa's head, and uh, he was helped along the way by, uh, uh, I guess, some of his uh, aunts and uncles with uh, aunts with um, with special things to give him power, like a, a polished shield and a, a helmet that made him invisible, and I think a few other, some uh, shoes that were very made him very fast and. Um, Anyway, so when he, of course, you, you know the legend where he went into the cave and he used the shield uh, and the sharp sword that also was given to him to uh, cut off Medusa's head without looking at her because if you looked at her, you turned to stone. So, uh, uh, and after he cut off his her head, um, he dripped some of the blood from her head into seawater in the cave. And uh, this is not the only time this happened, but but from that seawater and uh, which was considered Poseidon, you know, part of Poseidon and Medusa, uh, Pegasus was born. So Pegasus came up from the, uh, uh, from that. And so of course now he had Pegasus and he was, uh, um, and as he was, he was writing. So this is the story of actually three, three good stories. And all three of them are, of course are in the night sky. Uh, and uh, so he mounted Pegasus and they were flying back to uh, to give the head to the king that requested it. And on the way, he came across a, a maiden chained to a rock. And of course, that's Andromeda. And uh, the story of her story is, is that uh, she was very pretty and her mother was like to brag about how pretty she and her mother were. And that angered the sea nymphs. And they went to Poseidon and said, you need to you need to punish them. So he came to, he, he went, went to uh, Cepheus, who was the king and Cassiopeia and said, if you don't sacrifice your daughter, I'm going to destroy uh, um, okay, Ethiopia. And it's got two names, Ethiopia, and I've heard it also Joppa. But, uh, and so they chained, uh, chained her to a rock and he summoned the, they summoned the sea monster, which is also in the night sky. And so as Perseus was flying by, he saw this and he pulled Medusa's head out and the sea monster turned to stone. He rescued uh, Andromeda uh, and of, of course, uh, Cepheus and Cassiopeia were happy to have him marry Andromeda and they went off and had a family and there's a whole, whole other mythologies about that. But anyway, that's kind of the legends that we're gonna be looking at. And this is this is the uh, area of the sky, and and if you stay up till about midnight tonight, it's it's like this, looking toward the east, uh, because I know because I was out looking at the Perseid meteor showers, and this is about where Perseus was, about that far above the constel above the horizon, about midnight. But um, anyway, I like to call this the fall square. Uh, this comes from a series of uh, um, charts having the broken down into like the fall square, the summer triangle, the winter hexagon, and the spring diamond. Um, but the, uh, so this is the square of Pegasus and it's, it's all second magnitude stars. So it's pretty easy to see. Uh, and uh, you've got Pegasus, Andromeda, Perseus, Cassiopeia, um, and Cetus, the uh, sea monster. And just out of the thing is, is Cepheus, and I'm, I'm going to show you that in a second. And this is just a thing from from uh, Stellarium, which I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. That shows uh, shows what they would look 
you know, they might, they, somebody imagined them as Pegasus and the sea monster and Perseus. And Cassiopeia, of course, is uh, known as a queen sitting in a chair. And here's Cepheus. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start out by um, with the North Star because uh, because two or three of these con three of these constellations are within the North. And of course, you know that the North Star, uh, the like the Dipper, rotates around. Well, this time of year in the fall and uh, Actually, it's still not quite down this far. It's, it's about, up there. but when it gets down here, it's hard to see it uh, 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 unless you're up in uh, up, up in the north down here in Arkansas. Sometimes it, it gets kind of low, especially if you've got trees. But uh, there's another way to see, and that is Cassiopeia. So directly across from from the Big Dipper is Cassiopeia. So you can see that uh, Cassiopeia uh, rotates around just like the Big Dipper was. And so if you think of it kind of like an M, M sit the M, I th think it looks like an M this way and a W the other way. It's kind of, uh, you can kind of see the relationship to the North Star and find the North Star that way. And here is the, uh, a chart of the North Star, of course, with the Big Dipper. And you can see Cepheus, Cassiope, and Perseus all, all in a line here that all rotate pretty much around the poles. So they're pretty close to the, the north, uh, northern north star. So I want to start out with Perseus and Cassiopeia. Uh, so um, you find them by finding north and looking to the northwest uh, in the fall. And Cassiopeia is very evident to, to see this W. And Perseus is, is a bright constellation also. I think it kind of looks like a T uh, uh, with, a, with a long arm that kind of points down to the Pleiades. Um, but some interesting objects that are easy, actually easy to find, and the double cluster is a uh, very bright, like fourth magnitude or thir thirty and a half. So you can see it in fairly. Uh, you don't even have to have real dark skies, fifth magnitude or something like that. Star skies. Uh, magnitudes are a measure of how bright an object is. The brightest objects are first magnitude. Uh, or zero magnitude and, and go up to about, and our, uh, the least that we can see is about sixth magnitude. Uh, like this is a bright second magnitude. This one is a variable star that goes from second magnitude to, to third magnitude. And uh, these are mostly second magnitude stars. So these are, it's easy to see these. And uh, even in, uh, in not, I'm not going to say city skies, but uh, uh, you can if you get into a dark spot with maybe without a uh, without light shining on you. But the double cluster is real easy to find between Cassiopeia and Perseus right there. And that's that's one of the first objects I looked at with a I built a four and a half inch telescope back when I was a kid a long time ago. Actually, I was, uh, I was about 22, I think. But um, one of the first objects I looked at was a double cluster and it's it's a really nice thing to look at with that size telescope. Uh, and I'll show you another picture of it in a minute. Another thing that's easy to find here is M34, which is an open cluster. Uh, M103 is not quite as easy, but it's it's pretty easy. Um, the, this With binoculars, this area around Perseus is a very nice area with a lot of stars. And Algo is the... Uh, uh, demon star, uh, and it gets bright, gets dimmer every 2.87 days. Uh, and it's, uh, and so if you look at it, if it's as bright as, as this star are almost as bright, then you know it's, it's not in eclipse. And, uh, if it's as bright as it's about right here or right here, like these two stars, then it's, uh, then it's in eclipse. So here's a picture of the double cluster. Uh, it's a young cluster, about 14 million years old, consisting of 300 hot, young, blue, white, supergiant stars. Except that in one of the clusters, there's five orange uh, or red giant stars. So that just uh, that just makes it really pop out. And, and you can, can see those in your library telescope. And it's fun to try to see them. 
Uh, so when you look at the double cluster, don't forget to look for these uh, red stars. And it's pretty far away. It's about 7,500 light years. And here's what Algol is a eclipsing binary star. And it's been known since ancient times. And that's why they call it the demon star. So it's, it's basically the eye of Medusa. Uh, it's what they pictured it as in the uh, uh, in ancient in pictures, medieval picture pictures taken during that time, uh, not taken, but uh, paintings and things like that. Um, it dims by over a magnitude uh, every 2.84 days. So uh, you can catch it in fairly often. You can catch it in eclipse and dimmer than it normally is. Next, I want to move up from Cassiopeia up to the square of Pegasus and Andromeda. And uh, the square of Pegasus is easy. It's, it's a square with, uh, oops. With the uh, legs sticking off of it. Uh, I have a hard time making a horse out of it. But anyway, I like the square. Uh, Andromeda, look, to me, looks like a cornucopia uh, coming, coming off of Alpha. A actually, Alpha is uh, not part of Pegasus. It's part of Andromeda. Uh, and beta, alpha, and gamma here are, are part of Pegasus. But the uh, neat thing about Andromeda is it's got the Andromeda galaxy, which I'm sure you've heard of. And it's fairly easy to find once you figure out uh, going from the from the square of Pegasus, go out two stars toward the toward the north, and uh, and and then up two stars, and then M31 is right next to that star. And if you're in a dark sky, you can see it. You don't have to have a telescope. It's actually about uh, third magnitude or three, three and a half, and uh, it's it's visible. Another uh, object here is M33 is about uh, five and a half magnitude, so it's visible in binoculars in a small telescope. It's it's harder to see than than uh, uh, M31, but you can see how to find it. You star, you came down here and found Andromeda. You go the other way to find M33, and that's the Triangulum Galaxy. And here's the uh, constellation Triangulum right below it, a little triangle. And uh, it's probably not going to look quite this good in a library telescope, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it'll be nice in, in either binoculars or a telescope. It's also got, it's our twin galaxy about two and a half million light years away. It's about 260,000 light years wide. And it's got two uh, two satellite galaxies. One of them's right here and the other one's right here, M32 and M110. Now you're not gonna be able to see those with binoculars, but you should be able to see them with your telescope on a good night in a, in a fairly dark sky. And then the tri here's the triangulum galaxy uh, in uh, triangulum. And then there's a globular cluster in Pegasus. And I think I'll show you, I'll, I'll be able to show you how to find that in a minute. Um, it's pretty easy to find off of one of uh, Pegasus' legs. And uh, uh, it's easy. A lot of times it's better, if, if you've got a pair of binoculars to use with your library telescope, that'll help you find some things especially objects like these that are that are good in both binoculars and um, uh, telescope. Okay, now I'm going to go and, and uh, show a few few other constellations. Uh, so within you can see Aries right here under tri triangulum. We saw how to find triangulum a minute ago. Well, Aries is below it. Of course, Aries is a uh, Zodiac constellation, and it, it's pretty easy because these are pretty bright stars, these two right here, and that's, that one's a nice uh, double star. I don't know. I think it's probably uh, at high power in a library telescope. You can split it. Um, then Pisces is is a little harder because uh, uh, it's, it's dim stars, all dim stars. There's not, a, not any of them above fourth magnitude. And uh, but this little circle right here is kind of nice to look at with binoculars. And you can see it's right under the uh, 
uh, square of Pegasus. Um, Defta is in Cetus the whale, which is under uh, under Pisces, and uh, Defta these the tail is very visible. You see the shape of the tail here, and Defta is is a uh, is is one the only bright star in that area of the sky, and you can find Defta by using the uh, uh, I think that'd be the western leg of of Pegasus, and it comes straight down to Defta. Um, another thing that's interesting here is, uh, <clears throat> is Mira and Mira is a, uh, variable star that goes from almost out of your library telescope range up to naked eye to almost second magnitude. And, uh, so you can, if you know how to find it right here in the tail of Cetus, you can check and see if, if it, you can just see if it's, if it's, uh, if it's visible right now. And I, I like to, I find it, I check it by going and taking Aries and then counting down three stars in Pisces. And if there's a four star, Mira's, Mira's uh, visible. Um, and this is a fairly, not a real bright area of the sky, but it's important because it's because the planets and the uh, uh, moon and the sun go through Capricorn and Aquarius, uh, and the Capricorn's easy, pretty easy to trace out. Uh, it's got these two stars are pretty bright, and this one is. And if and you can see it kind of, to me, it looks like an emblem on the front of a car instead of a sea goat. Capricorn is actually a sea goat, and uh, but I like looking at it like this uh, uh, triangle, like or like maybe a Star Trek triangle. That 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 that's a little better too. Uh, Aquarius is is even a little bit dimmer, and uh, but you can trace it out fairly easy uh, in a dark sky. These are nice through binoculars. These two little water droplets dropping out of his water bucket. Uh, Aquarius also has a nice object in it, uh, M two, uh, which is fairly easy to find with binoculars or your telescope between those two stars. And M fifteen that I, I talked about a minute ago. Uh, this is off of Pegasus leg. Uh, you can find it fairly easy that way. And uh, M2 is a nice globular cluster. So we talked about open clusters, which were um, uh, which were the, uh, the double cluster and M34. Also, uh, and then galaxies, M32 and M33, M31 and M33. And then globular clusters like M2 and M15. So, uh, so you got those three three things in the fall skies. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is is if you remember, I think I can go back one. We found Difta in Cetus, which is a bright second magnitude star. Well, we can find going down the other leg farther, we can find Fomalha, which is in Pisces Australis. And so that's a first magnitude star and really the only first magnitude star in the fall in what I term the fall skies. There's some on both edges of it, but uh, uh, so Fomalhaut is, uh, is kind of pretty far south, but it's easily visible. And I've got a checklist uh, for binoculars and telescope and uh, it's also naked eye. So you can see on here, I've got Perseus and the double cluster. So constellations are on here too. So you don't have to, you don't have to wait till you have a telescope to start filling out your list. Uh, double, Algol is easily visible without a telescope, but I've got the stars as the, uh, as the import, most important ones, the best, best ones and the, the ones that, uh, that you want to see, like M31 galaxy. That's something that it's nice to say that you've seen it. And M31 galaxy and double cluster are two really good things for a library telescope. Mine's not showing up down here, but down at the bottom right now, and I'm gonna show you where they are. Saturn is in Aquarius and they're both in the fall sky. And Jupiter is in uh, uh, Aries. And I'll pull up Stellarium here in a second. And uh, we'll see where those are. So we'll stop share.
so this is the sky right now and i've got got my got the constellations turned on solarium is a very nice program to learn the sky with or after you after you learn it to go out and and uh just check things out see uh different things about see where things are in the sky let me turn off the uh meteor showers okay so let me turn the labels on so right now uh saturn is in aquarius and so it's the only bright object in that area of the sky and uh Oh, uh, Jupiter's not up yet. This is toward the east. So th this is actually a, a 2216. What would that be? Oh, that's that's later on tonight. Um, but you can, uh, let me go ahead and bring it up. So here's Aries under, under uh, and Jupiter's still not up. So there's Jupiter and Aries. So they're both easy to find. If they're up, uh, they're very, uh, they're, they're brighter. Jupiter's brighter than any other star except Ven Venus, any planet except Venus. And uh, Venus isn't up right now. And Saturn's the brightest object in its area. So it'd be easy to find too. I'm gonna go over here to the North Star. And you see how, um, and this is how it was the other night about uh, midnight is uh, the North, the Big Dipper's dipped all the way under the horizon or down to the lower part of the, on the horizon. Then rising is Perseus, Cassiopeia, and Cepheus is almost right up above. Uh, so uh, and I was wanting to kind of center on the North Star and show you, show you how the stars rotate at night. They'll rotate around and it'll get daylight. And come back to, and, and 24 hours later, they'll be in almost the same spot. So you can see that pretty easy in the north sky. Uh, just a couple more things that I wanted to point out is even though this is the fall constellations, Right now, and even into the fall, uh, we still got a lot of summer stuff up. And uh, one thing I want 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 you to be sure and look at is the Pleiades, which are right here, and they'll come up almost with the fall constellations. So they'll it'll be evident in the east, and you see it naked eye also, and that's an excellent object for the library telescope. Um, One of the nicest things about summer is the summer Milky Way. And that's when the Milky Way is really bright. And and you can see it coming down between Scorpius and Sagittarius. And then, uh, uh, and and it's it stays up until like um, uh, middle of October. And that's when it's really spectacular. It seems like to me is when it's over on the, it, it's it's over, and getting ready getting ready to set when Scorpius is set and Sagittarius is just up. Uh, above it is it, you have the summer triangle that's still out, and that's uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, in uh, Quila the Eagle, Lyra the Lyre, and Cygnus. So. That's a good signpost for the sky like the fall square is. And uh, I think that's all I had, Don. So I guess question. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Rocky. So uh, yeah. we're running just a little bit long here, but uh, we'll stay on for just a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, so, Rocky, um, one of the things that I've always liked about um, you know, the library telescope and even binoculars in particular is that I think in urban skies, it can be hard to see um, stars and constellations. So you can star hop, if you know what that is. In other words, 
you're looking for the Big Dipper, but you can't see all of them because it's just the bad. It's just really bright. But the, the binoculars can really help you find those stars, right, and trace things yeah. better. And even in uh, like Cygnus the Swan, which is through the Milky Way. So um, that that is one of the big things about it. And I think the other thing that's always struck me is, uh, and people are surprised by this, is that um, you can see things with binoculars that you can't see with telescopes. And that's yeah. what I mean by that is that the field of view is so wide on the binocular that you can see the whole uh, Pleiades, which is gorgeous. But if you look at it through a really powerful telescope, you'll see a couple stars. I did have one other thing real quick, because okay. when you get your library telescope out, the most important thing to do just to help you find things is to make sure that your finder is uh, is adjusted correctly. So uh, just real quick to your red red dot finder, uh, you want to find a bright, easily identifiable object and, uh, uh, you know, a bright star probably or planet and get it in the telescope's eyepiece. And then you can adjust the red dot finder by adjusting these this knob and this knob and try to get it get it centered up and uh, then make sure that works. And that's the first thing I ever do. I do anytime I get out my telescope. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting trying to find things when you could actually find them easy. We've also got uh, a saddle, what I call, I like to call a saddle finder on a lot of scopes now. And uh, uh, we, and we do that because we've had a lot of trouble with the red dot finders keeping them maintained. And, and uh, but the way you find things through it is there's a couple of holes in it. And if you've got a bright object, the holes work pretty good and you can center them up. Uh, for dimmer objects, you might want to sight over the sight over the top. And adjustment is just if 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 it needs to be adjusted, you might be able to loosen these two screws and move it around move it around a little bit to get it centered after after you've got it in your scope and see how it's centered in your eyepiece. Sometimes if it's not centered, I just note where it is and put the next object. You know, if it's on one edge of the eyepiece, uh, one edge of the saddle finder. I put it on one on that and it's on one side of it, then I'll try to find the next object in that same location. I just wanted to go over that real quick because I think that's uh, important to find instead of gone. Okay. Well, if you want to go ahead and stop screen share. So do we have any other questions from the group here? We're about ready to wrap up. And thanks, Rocky. It's, uh, it's always great to talk about, well, fall is just a fun thing anyway. It's starting to get dark earlier. And uh -huh. we got these wonderful objects in the sky. And I will say that the Milky Way, you know, it's important to find a, a period when there's no moon, you know, when the moon's not up yet, because the, the Milky Way will be, um, because the moon's so bright, it'll just make it, it'll wash it out a little bit. So if you're looking for the Milky Way, you really need to find where there's what they call new, new moon, or the moon's not quite up yet. Uh, but fall is such a fun time. It gets dark earlier, and uh, things uh, start getting cooler. It's a little nicer. And... Um, and of course, I think you were showing your latitude roughly from Arkansas, and that'll change. Oh, yeah. I will change a little bit based on where you are. So we get up here in, in the St. Louis area, we get a little bit more sky than you do as far as the uh, Big Dipper. Big Dipper will be up a little higher and all that kind of stuff, but it's still going to be pretty low. And if you go up further north, of course, it'll be even higher in the sky and reverse on the south. So um, Something about the fall that I realized is, uh, to, you know, it's getting darker early every, earlier every night. So if you're out and see the stars come out, they come out in almost the same place every night. Yeah, <laughs> they don't yeah. seem to go. They don't seem to go down the sky. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing to watch out. This is one of my first. Uh oh, I didn't know this thing, and it gets very dewy in the fall. At least here in the Metro St. Louis area, we had some folks out last night, and they literally no more than got their telescopes out, and they were literally wet with dew. And so you really need to account for that uh, as far as binoculars and things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, I see some great jobs, Rocky. And I don't see too many more questions, but we had uh, a really good program tonight, and I really appreciate that. So we are um, going to, uh, rec we've recorded this, and I'll trim, uh, we had some just informal discussions. I'll trim that off tonight, get that posted out there tomorrow on YouTube. And next month on the uh, September 13th, we have one of our members from the old Omaha area. Uh, we'll be talking about pocket planetarium. So we've had a lot of fun with some of the technology. Uh, some of us are getting kind of lazy these days. We don't even bring out the old planispheres and charts. We just get a, 
uh, one of those next those two technology items it'll tell us exactly what's going on where and we cheat that way and so uh, but anyway it works pretty good and it's something i think particularly younger people will really uh, understand very well and have a lot of fun with so that's kind of where the whole thing is going so rocky thank you and, and tom lynch i know you've been back there pretty quiet tonight but you've been helping me with the facebook stuff thanks very much and thanks for all of you for joining and we'll we'll look forward to next month september 13th it'll be uh, eight o'clock central nine o'clock eastern time uh, on pocket planetariums all right well thanks everybody and have a great evening <laughs>